All right, congratulations to all of those of you who came in so promptly. Uh, good morning, my name is David Leighton Brown. I want to welcome all of those participating in this meeting of Shining Waters Regional Council of the United Church of Canada. I'm the president of Shining Waters and on the screen with me is Peter Hartmans, the executive minister for both Canadian Shield Regional Council and of course, Shining Waters Regional Council. We'll take a few minutes to orient ourselves to this new way of being together before we constitute the meeting. For now, I would ask that you please turn off your video and microphone. And if you're on the phone, please mute, mute yourself. And Jody will lead us through some technicality. Thanks, David. Uh, the first thing that we want to make sure that everyone has done is to please uh, make sure that your name is correct on your on your um, <clears throat> on the screen so that we're able to find you. Uh, we'd like your full first and last name as you would have used them to register. And we'll ask anyone who is not a voting member to please put the letter Z in front of your name and that way you'll drop to the bottom of the participants list and it just helps our scrutineers when we're voting to, uh, to know who, uh, who is uh, able to vote. I've also posted into the chat box uh, the link to a very helpful Zoom tip sheet um, that is on our website. And so if you're having any difficulty with things like uh, turning off your video or, or finding the chat box, all of that information is on this tip sheet and available to you. Um, also, at any time during the meeting, you can type into the chat box to Donna Roots. And if you're having a tech issue, she can help you resolve that. At this point, we have the chat box open to allow you to chat with anyone in the meeting. And we're going to leave it that way until we complete the land acknowledgement. And then when we move into the business of the meeting, we're going to limit the chat so that you are only able to chat to the host or the co-hosts of the meeting. Uh, and this is to ensure that while we're having the conversation uh, around considering the proposals or other aspects of the business, that only the person who's been acknowledged by the chair is speaking. Uh, but we do want you to be able to contact uh, the, the host and the co-hosts in case you are having any questions or you, uh, you need any help with anything. And in, we will also open the chat box again um, during the in memoriam service and also during the installation of the new president so that you can participate in those. But during the business time, the chat will be limited. Um, if at any time during the meeting you have a point of order, please type point of order in uppercase in the chat to Kim Uetakai and she'll make sure that we address that. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to mention, if you do get bumped out of the meeting, you'll need to use the link that was emailed to you to get back in. And you can also email Donna for help. And Donna, if you wanna put your email address into the chat, um, but if you lose your internet or you're having problems with your computer, you can still join by phone using the number that was provided in that same email. And I wanted to share a tip that I learned from our friends in Canadian Shield Regional Council. Write the number down on a piece of paper, because if you lose your computer, you won't have access to the email. And then this way you can still participate and make sure you also include the meeting ID. Uh, and uh, the last thing I just want to mention is please type your full name into the chat to Donna uh, and Donna Roots, and this way we have a role for the meeting today. Um, we're going to move into a test vote at this time. We're going to be using the raise hand um, feature for voting, and for most of us, you'll find that in your reactions, but for some of you, it may be at the bottom of your participant le list. Those of you who are on the phone will use star nine to vote. And uh, those who are sharing a computer screen, one of you can use the raise hand function and the other uh, can type your vote into the chat to Kim Uetakai uh, when, when you're called on. Uh, and we're gonna do a test. So I'm gonna turn that over to David, thanks. Thank you very much. So we uh, are going to have a test motion. Uh, and uh, that motion is 
that all members of the executive be tattooed with the Shining Waters Regional Council logo. Now, all those in favor will please raise your hand now. Participants on the phone should please use star nine. And if there are multiple users, type your vote in the chat to Jody. The votes have been, the yes votes have been counted, uh, David. Thank you. Now, if you wish to vote no, please raise your hand now. All right, the no votes have been counted. And if you wish to abstain, please raise your hand now. All right, those votes have been counted, David. Would you like the results of the vote? Yes, please. So the vote uh, for the yes votes are 69, the vote notes are 24, and the abstentions are one. Well, I feel pretty confident that the members of the executive all voted no, but the will of the regional council has been heard and will be given all of the serious consideration that it warrants. The motion, to my somewhat surprise, passed. And now, in the name of Jesus Christ, head of the church, and by the authority conferred on me by the first meeting of Shining Waters Regional Council, I hereby declare this second meeting of Shining Waters Regional Council to be in session for the work that may properly be brought before it to the glory of God. I acknowledge that Shining Waters Regional Council is located on land that has traditionally been occupied by a variety of Indigenous peoples including the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is also the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which committed participants to peacefully share and care for the resources of the Great Lakes region. May we honor the spirit of that commitment in our activities today and into the future. I would like to invite everyone to type into the chat the acknowledgement of the particular treaty holder or uh, traditional indigenous inhabitant of the land on which you are personally located. While you're doing that, I will further acknowledge that this meeting and Shining Waters region is a safe space a safe space for all individuals and for all points of view. We not only welcome, but actively invite the expression of all points of view, because it is only in listening to the widest possible range of thought that truth emerges. I would now like to invite by video, Evan Newton Swan Smith from Toronto Urban Native Ministry to welcome us to the territory on which we gather. Are we having technical difficulties with the oh, sound? Yes. On this video? If there's someone else who can play the video, my sound is not working. Apologies. <laughs> well, that video is an important one, but perhaps we will be able to return to it later in the meeting. For the moment, the consent and procedural motions which form our consent agenda are found on our website at the link posted in the chat box. You have all had an opportunity to review the consent agenda prior to this meeting. Mm -hmm. Please indicate in the chat to Jody if you wish to have an item removed from the consent agenda to be placed on the meeting's agenda. 
if any five voting members request, an item will be moved. I have not received any messages, David. All right, thank you. In that case, it is moved by Peter Hartman and seconded by Betty Lou McNabb that the consent agenda be adopted. If you wish to vote yes, please raise your hand now. And I remind you for participants on the phone, please use star nine. And if there are multiple users sharing a computer, please type your vote in the chat to Jody. The yes votes have been counted. Thank you. If you wish to vote no, please raise your hand now. Take it, nothing's coming from the chat, Kim. Okay. So uh, the no votes have been counted. Thank you. If you wish to abstain, please raise your hand now. <clears throat> Those have been counted, David. And the result of the uh, vote is uh, 90 yes, no, no votes, and one abstention. Thank you. So all items on the consent agenda are adopted. I'm pleased to introduce our two chaplains for this meeting, Philip Cable and Monica Moore. Each of these folks are available by phone and I encourage anyone who needs pastoral care during this meeting to reach out to one of the chaplains. Their numbers are posted in the chat and will be posted again throughout the meeting. I'm also pleased to introduce our parliamentarian, Beth Moore. Beth is a member of Birch Cliff Bluffs United Church. And I'm pleased to welcome Eric Matheson as our general counsel representative to this meeting. Eric is the chief financial officer of the United Church of Canada. He will be speaking to us a bit later this morning. We will now have worship pre-recorded by members of the Social and Ecological Justice Commission. Please start that video.
Welcome to this sacred space as we worship together today. I'm Susan Eagle, the chair of the Social and Ecological Justice Commission, and I'm joined today by members and staff from the Commission, as well as musicians from Forest Grove United in Toronto and Grace United in Barrie. It is a privilege to share worship together. We light a Christ candle to remind us of the light of Christ and the call to us to be light and warmth for each other. And now, let us worship. We gather from the east, west, north, and south to do the work of Shining Waters Regional Council. We come at a time such as this, fully aware that we are living through perilous times. We come fully aware that the God who journeyed with our ancestors is with us as we gather. Come, let us worship. And let us sing together, called by earth and sky from more voices, 135.
Let us pray our opening prayer. We gather as Channing Water Regional Council for such a time as this. Despite living through this season of pandemic, we come to reflect upon the work we have done, are doing, and will continue to do. The prophet Joel reminds us that we should be glad and rejoice for God has given us the autumn and the spring rains and we will have plenty to eat. Yet we are aware that despite the plenty, there are many within this region who are vulnerable due to living beyond the poverty lines, the homeless, the hungry, the addicted, and the list goes on. Help us to discover within ourselves the vulnerab or vulnerabilities that will enable us to find hope within ourselves and be hope to God's world. May the work we do bring hope to the hopeless and may the generosity of God's love be our vision today and always. Amen. Reading from the scriptures, Joel chapter 2, verses 21 to 27. Don't fear, fertile land. Rejoice and be glad, for the Lord is about to do great things. Don't be afraid, animals of the field, for the meadows of the wilderness will turn green. The tree will bear its fruit. The fig tree and grapevine will give their full yield. Children of Zion, rejoice and be glad in the Lord your God, because he will give you the early rain as a sign of righteousness. He will pour down abundant rain for you, the early and the late rain as before. The, the threshing floor will be full of grain. The vast will overflow with new wine and fresh oil. I will repay you for the years that the cutting locust, the swarming locust, the hopping locust, and the devouring locust of Eden, my great army which I sent against you. You will eat abundantly and be satisfied, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has done wonders for you. And my people will never again be put to shame. You will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God, no other exists. Never again will my people be put to shame. A reading from the First Testament. As we think about ministry in this time of COVID-19, we consider what it means for such a time as this to be in ministry. Each of us have had to ask ourselves questions of how we may seek to reduce harm in the world around us during this time. Each of us have had to figure out new ways of engaging and responding pastorally and with justice in mind. For such a time as this, whose lives do we want to save? It's time to think about loving the homeless in your community. For Jesus' sake, find your local agency that supports them and donate. A tent. A warm coat. Sturdy winter boots, even if they're used. Warm socks, wool, not cotton.
cash. Better yet, go to your local government and demand that they find and provide permanent housing so no one is homeless. And if you want guidance for being an advocate for people having a home, check with the Shelter and Housing Justice Network. I'm Cameron Watts from Forest Grove United Church. My name is Lois Brown, Minister at Unity United Church in Midland. For such a time like this, we need to save the lives of our seniors, our friends and relatives who now reside in retirement and nursing homes. Recently, three of us from Unity led a worship service at such a home for the first time in 20 months. We sang with joy. I'm sure there are many other seniors' homes who would love to have group visits from their local congregations. Do you know any place that you can live for $300 a month? The province of Ontario thinks that you can do it. Social assistance checks provide as little as $300 a month shelter allowance for a single person. It's woefully inadequate. And COVID made it worse. Last winter, COVID exposed a huge gap in community supports. Sure, motel shelters were expanded, but there were still hundreds of people who had no place to go. Agencies, public buildings, fast food outlets, washrooms, even a place to get a glass of water were closed down. More groups stepped up to help. Necessary, life-saving Band-Aid support, but it was still Band-Aid. And post-COVID, the problem will be worse. The province casually acknowledges that poverty budgets will be cut again this year. Who would we save? Queen Esther saves her people whose people are the homeless. The plight of poor people here in Los Angeles is so unbelievable, the likes of which I have not yet seen in Toronto or in Manila. There was a downpour the other day or so, and a young couple in camp right outside the Sally Ann had all their belongings hanging on the fence. There was a man who I thought was just wearing low cut pants but he was really skinny and his genitals were exposed as his pants dragged around his feet. Another man was undressing at the Metro subway entrance after having just relieved himself. There was a woman selling pencils to another person on the street and I noticed that her legs were swollen and gangrenous. As an avid public transit person who prefers walking to the Metro or over a cab or Uber. I have to train myself not to walk on human feces that littered the sidewalks. The lack of public facilities is evident as urine rivulets along the subway car floors that I have to remind myself not to rest my bags on the subway floor. In the meantime, wealth displayed is ostentatious with luxury cars speeding past. And so we ask, where is their God? For such a time as this, who would you save? Only God will save. You say your heart's been turned to stone. You say you want to be left alone. You say I have only made you weep and mourn. Like a dry river bed Stopped waiting for the water Long ago you said You better pray all night For the rain instead Love comes like a tidal wave Over your head Love is the water that wears down the rock Love is the water that wears down the rock Love is the power that won't be stopped Love is the water that wears down the rock Too long, dolls 
the sharp and mine, and weak and the strong. Well, you may be right, but you may be wrong. Cause love can make a mountain come a tumbling down. Love is the water that wears down the rock. The love is the water that wears down the rock. The love is the power that won't be stopped. River watches over every woman and man Feet in the gravel and mud in your hands Nothing can stand against love's command Every boulder turns into the grain of sand Love is the water that wears down the rock Love is the water that wears down the rock Love is the power that won't be stopped Friends, let us go with a message of hope to love radically. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you very much to those who prepared uh, that worship for us. I understand the video welcoming us to the traditional territories is now available. So can we show that, please? Noted indigenous cause, Miji K. Dodem, Anishinaabe Nish Mandogan Dow, Toronto Ninjaba. Good morning. My name is Reverend Evan Smith. I've been serving for six years at Toronto Urban Native Ministry, which is a shared ecumenical ministry between the United Church and the Anglican Diocese of Toronto. Welcome to the beginning of Shining Waters Regional Council meetings. This is a different kind of meeting. Well, one that I think we're becoming accustomed to. We can't gather together and give hugs and handshakes and physically sit at tables together, but we're still together. <clears throat> we're still a part of God's creation. We're still called together as the church. And it's a blessing for us to have this opportunity to come together and to discern what God's calling is on our lives on our congregation's lives and for the greater world. When we went into ministry, I don't think that any of us imagined this is what it would look like. Since March, Toronto Urban Native Ministry has been working in the homeless encampment around Church of the Holy Trinity where we're located in downtown Toronto. We've served upwards of 200 meals per day we have provided people with their basic needs. We've helped to get donations of tents and tarps and the things that folks need, especially going into the winter. We've also advocated with the city for overdose prevention sites, for naloxone training, and to stop clearing out our homeless encampments. This is not what I thought ministry would look like, but I wouldn't trade it for anything because it's here on the streets that I see God at work in the lives of people. I can't be with you live this morning because it's the beginning of turkey season. So my partner Jess, who's a student, her hopefully going on internship soon, and I are sitting out in the bush somewhere waiting for a bird to walk past us, but probably mostly just staring at the clouds. But I love hunting and the seasons that it brings because it reminds me that things are always changing. Fall hunting season is different than spring hunting season. The birds act differently. Nature acts differently. The weather feels different. And it's a reminder that God's creation is constantly moving in a forward motion. My friends, we profess a God who is alive, who works in us and others by the Spirit, a God who is not dead, but was risen, and who continues to be at work in this world. 
just like creation, which is all around us, no matter where we're located right now. God's work is changing. The needs of our communities are constantly changing. And as ministry and church personnel and congregation members and followers of Jesus, we are always being asked to go into situations with our eyes open and our hearts open so that we can witness to the pain and the joys and the struggles of others and respond accordingly. This is something that the United Church has been trying to do since the calls to the church from the Indigenous Church have come out. The Indigenous calls to the church speak about a new relationship, about a new way of moving forward. They acknowledge that Indigenous people have always been present in the history of the United Church of Canada, but that going forward, we need new relationship. There are many responsibilities outlined in the calls to church for regions and for congregations and communities of faith. Everything from reconciliation work to financial support, to digging into our theology and looking at ways that Indigenous theology complements, corresponds, and sometimes differs from different Christian, white, Western theologies. But this is hard work and it's work that the church is doing. And so I wanted to mention the calls to the church because just like the Thanksgiving address in the Haudenosaunee traditions, it's the words that come before all words. It's what grounds us as a church that's committed to reconciliation and to walking forward together. And so I'd encourage you, if you haven't looked at the calls to the church lately, to pull up a copy, to glimpse at them, or to read them in depth, to pray over them, and to remember that those are the words that guide our church as we do this work. We are also a church committed to being multicultural and to working on anti-racism for all of our community members. My friends, our church has a long history and a lot of damage has been done. But just as each morning comes anew, just as the seasons change, so does our church and so does our work. The scripture tells us that God's mercies are new every morning. And for that, I am so thankful because each morning I wake up revived with a sense of God at work in my life and knowing that whatever mistakes I've made, whatever things I've done to hurt people, I'm able to correct and I'm still able to move forward surrounded by the love of God. And so my friends, I pray that we are able to figure out as a region what it looks like to be in relationship with each other. As Toronto Urban Native Ministry, we stand in dual belonging in the church. So our church is a member of Shining Waters, but also the national indigenous region. This is not easy work. Some of it is paperwork and it's hard to figure out. Some of it is about relationship and who has responsibilities that they need to uphold. But at the core, it's about working together, about coming together, united by God's love and united by our love of people and for creation to figure out how we can right the wrongs of the past and move forward in a good way. My prayer this morning and for this whole weekend is that we will have hearts that are opened, ears that will listen, eyes that will see, and hands that are willing to do the hard work that God has called us to do. And that we'll do that in deep relationship with each other, where we listen, where there's space for pain and for hurt, but there's also joy and celebration because my friends, a new thing is happening in this church. We see it. We see the ways that we've adapted during COVID, the ways that we have embraced new technologies, 
the ways that we have tried to figure out different ways of worshiping and connecting with the people that we care about. And when we talk about a church revival, this is what we're talking about, about being open to God's calling on our lives and responding wholeheartedly with faith that the Holy Spirit embraces each and every one of us and that Jesus walks alongside us and that God, the holy mystery at the center of it all, is always with us, always guiding us, and always with us, so that we never have to be afraid, unsure, but not afraid, because we know that we are beloved children of the Creator. And so go forward into this meeting with that knowledge that you have a reason to be here, that you have been called, and that you are going to do great things. And I look forward to meeting you later, perhaps with a good hunting story. Miigwech. Thank you, Evan. We're now going to begin with proposals that have been directed to Shining Waters Regional Council for Action. Our first proposal is continuation of the Social and Ecological Justice Commission. We had an opportunity to discuss this proposal at our town hall meeting on November 3rd. Susan Eagle, chair of the commission, is with us to answer questions that may have arisen following that gathering. 
Susan, please unmute yourself and your video is already on. Susan will speak first to the proposal for up to 90 seconds. If any of you have questions or wish to speak to the motion, please raise your hand. There will be a 90 second limit for each speaker. Please pay attention to the timer on screen. At my discretion, the time may be extended where the circumstances warrant it to allow for equitable participation. There will be an opportunity for a 60 second final comment from Susan. So Susan, over to you. Thank you very much, David, and good morning, everyone. I'm speaking uh, to the proposal for the continuation of the Social Justice, Social and Ecological Justice uh, Commission. And you'll find that in your materials attached to that uh, proposal is our report from a year ago, which is the appendix. And there also is an accountability report this year. So I invite you to look at both documents because you'll get an outline of the work that we've done and I don't then need to repeat it. The commission came into existence uh, two years ago and it came into existence as on a trial basis, approved by the uh, regional meeting in the late spring of 2019. Um, <clears throat> since then, our commission has met regularly, <clears throat> excuse me, using the lenses of racial justice and ecological justice um, around three themes, economic, environment, and racial justice. Our linkages uh, in the community, and we were asked about this, have been both through the communities of faith in one direction and to general counsel in the other, with connections to the SJNOR, the Social Justice Network of Regions, as well as ISARC, Kairos, PalNet, and Right Relations. In doing the work that we've been doing, we tried to connect to communities of faith, first of all, by identifying issues, <clears throat> excuse me, that came from the communities of faith, as well as issues that were being directed to us from general council or the larger region. Okay, Susan, uh, your time has expired. So are you, and automatically you have been muted. Uh, are there any questions uh, or comments uh, that are coming in through the raised hand? David, George, Isaac, and uh, Jeanette Sheik have their hands up. Okay, first, George Isaac, would you please unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm very hopeful that this, this commission continues, but I wonder why they're not working on ecological things like climate change. Is it? Okay, we'll uh, ask Susan to respond to that in her final comment. Uh, Jeanette, would you please unmute yourself? I do think that this commission would continue my my question to the group is um, what um, staff support has been provided to them? I know it was identified that it was important um, and and what support do they need going forward or is what they've already been granted on this basis reasonable? Okay, uh, Peter, could you perhaps uh, speak to the staff support provided to this commission? Um, so the uh, Social and Ecological Commission has the support of Jeffrey Dale. Um, it, it started with Brienne Swan, but we shifted our staffing complement uh, this fall, and Jeffrey has been um, assigned to that task. My sense is they receive both good support and uh, staff support in terms of budget and staffing. It's, it's part-time support, like all our commissions. Uh, all four of our commissions, which I appreciate very much and um, admire the work they do, are supported uh, part time by by uh, assigned staff. So along with the other three commissions, the Social and Ecological Commission have a staff support person. Thank you, Peter. Are there any other questions or comments? Not seeing any raised hands, David. All right, then, uh, Susan, you can uh, carry on for your closing comment. Thanks very much. Um, in answer to the question about ecological justice, that was identified as a high priority 
when we broke our commission up into subcommittees to work on issues, ecological justice was one of those. Unfortunately, we never had a full complement of commission members and we lost um, one person who was very active around ecological justice. So in coming forward, we identified ecological justice as a high priority looking for membership on the commission um, and ways that we could be um, identifying further networks across the region. So our priority has not changed. Unfortunately, with COVID, there have been some, some changes in the way in which support has come to us. So going forward, we're looking for people and already some have come forward to uh, volunteer to be assisting us. Uh, so is there any final comment you wanted to make or uh, can we proceed to the vote? My final comment, David, would simply be that we that our proposal is requesting that this be turned into a permanent commission, that immediately the uh, new additional commission members be found, and that the two-year membership of the existing members be extended to the normal three, and then fit with the normal nominations process after that. All right. Thank you very much. So if we could please put the motion up on the screen. It has been... Moved by Susan Eagle, seconded by Eleanor Scarlett, the Shining Waters Regional Council adopt continuation of Social and Ecological Justice Commission as presented. You have heard the motion before you. If you wish to vote yes, please vote, raise your hand now. For participants on the phone, please use star nine. And if there are multiple users sharing a computer, please type your vote in the chat, Kim. Yudakai. All right, the uh, yes votes have been counted. Thank you. If you wish to vote no, please raise your hand now. The no votes have been counted. Thank you. If you wish to abstain, please raise your hand now. The, abs the abstentions have been counted. And the uh, final vote is 107 yes votes one no vote and two abstentions. Thank you very much. The motion is carried. Thank you to the members of the Social and Ecological Justice Commission for your leadership in our region. The next proposal for action by the Regional Council is raising our voice for human rights. Please note that there are two proposals with the same name that are very similar. The second proposal is for action by the General Council and will be considered this afternoon when we look at all the proposals to the General Council. We had the opportunity to discuss this proposal at our town hall meeting on October 6th. Robin Wardlaw is with us to answer questions that may have arisen following that gathering. Robin, please unmute yourself and turn on your video. Robin will speak first to the proposal for up to 90 seconds, and then if you have questions or comments, please raise your hand. Over to you, Robin. If I may be so bold. Uh, yes, okay. I, David, uh, I've, I've, I hear you, I've got a message from Robin that he's not able to, uh, to do this, and I'm the seconder of this motion, so. Uh, all right, would you please make the opening comment? Yeah, sorry about that. I, I guess I just got a text from Robin. Um, so this uh, this is for the region to act to create resources to support communities of faith so that they may uh, divest from funds invested in companies profiting from the Israeli occupation of Palestine. That's pretty clear. Um, this is really uh, to follow up what is already United Church policy uh, insofar as we've voted to uh, encourage divestment of companies who operate in the uh, occupied territories. Uh, and, uh, but we have never really implemented any support for trustees or others at the local level to be able to uh, know how to do that. In a, in a practical way. So uh, 
the original motions were called for uh, creating some tools to enable congregations to do that. But in this regard, uh, it's never really happened. And so we're simply following up on our policy to enable us to uh, try to create some tools and Palnet, uh, a, an arm or a committee of the Social and Ecological Justice Commission of the region is, is prepared to try to create some resources for congregations to uh, know how to do this in an efficient and uh, uh, timely manner. And uh, if you pass this motion, that's what would happen. Thank you, Brian. Your timing was impeccable. Uh, uh, are there any questions or comments uh, from members? David, uh, George Isaac has his hand up. Yes, George, would you please unmute yourself and turn on your video? Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to mention that Pelnet is not a priority for the Social and Ecological Justice Commission. The proposal title is very misleading. There are many human rights issues around the world. The Palestinian-Israeli problem is one of very many. The proposal is one-sided and anti-Israel. This, this is a complicated situation. Most of the Palestinians are governed by Hamas, a terrorist organization whose founding principle is to get rid of Israel. Their military ring is supported by Iran, which has the same objective. Hamas has also been cited for human rights abuses as well as Israel. The wall mentioned in the proposal was built to stop suicide bombers. The United Church has already condemned the settlements and encouraged a boycott of goods made there. This poorly written proposal does nothing new. Because of the anti-Jewish tone written deliberately that way, the proposal is likely to irritate the Canadian Jewish community and the media will likely ridicule the United Church for passing such a biased proposal. Thank you, David, Betty Lou McNabb has her hand up. Yes, Betty Lou, would you please unmute yourself and turn on your video? I had to find myself in the in the crowd. Um, <laughs> I just have a, a mine is more of a technical question. Um, Brian just said that he was the seconder of this motion, and in our paperwork it says that George Barlett was the seconder. I just uh, it's more of a technical question. Well, as long as George Bartlett and Brian are here, they'd have to be the mover and the seconder. Um, uh, since Robin's not here, he obviously can't move anything. So. Forgive me, I'm, Peter, but Robin I'm, is now back online. Oh, good, us. good, good, good. Yeah, we never, you never know about technical issues. Hey, I, My understanding I is that George Bartlett doesn't have, have standing in this meeting. That's, that's right, yeah. To be the seconder. Right. Yeah, so. you're right. Yeah, we, yeah. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Not seeing any additional hands, David. All right, Robin, welcome back. Uh, and would you uh, like to make the closing comment? Uh, thank you. That was a very unfortunate timing on my uh, technical <laughs> technical things here. This is uh, no more than making something of what the United Church has already decided over previous general councils. It's kind of a taking the bushel off our light uh, proposal. We have excellent um, justice seeking actions from before, but we, in the opinion of Palinet, we have not um, made sure that congregations are sufficiently aware of them. Uh, far from being anti-Israel, this kind of uh, motion is very pro-Israel. What we don't want is a nation that continues to um, severely impinge the human rights of its friends and neighbors uh, every day, every day. Uh, this may make for some discomfort on the part of some Canadians, but if we let the situation go, more Palestinians will surely continue to suffer and die. The United Church has a chance to join North American and European partners and speak up. Thank you, Robin. Again, your timing was impeccable. Um, you have all heard the motion before you. Uh, can we have it put up on the screen, please? If you wish to vote yes, to this motion, please raise your hand now. And for participants on the phone, please use star nine. 
and for multiple users sharing a computer, please type your vote into the chat to Kim Yudakai. And as someone um, said in the chat, if people could use just the hands up uh, emoticon rather than thumbs up or other things, those disappear. So, okay, I think the uh, yes votes have been counted. David. Thanks. If you wish to vote no, please raise your hand now. Okay, the no votes have been counted. And if you wish to abstain, please raise your hand now. All right, the abstentions have been counted. The result of the vote is 67 yes, 27 no, and 17 abstentions. Thank you, that motion is carried. Um, it is a little bit earlier than uh, we had anticipated, but I am going to uh, call for a 15 minute all purpose break now, uh, because we'll move to a different kind of uh, issue with our financial report and budget following the break. So we will resume at- David, I think we still have one more proposal to do. Uh, Decriminalization of illicit substances for personal use and harm reduction. I thought that came uh, in our second set of uh, proposals. Oh, it does. I apologize. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's always good when you're right and I'm wrong. So you're the president. So. <laughs> All right. No, uh, uh, not overlooking an important proposal like that. So we will resume at 1028 in 15 minutes time. Welcome back everyone. We're now going to turn our attention to the financial report and budget found on our website and in the resource book. A link is being posted in the chat. We had the opportunity to discuss the budget at the town hall meeting on November 10th. I invite Janet McDonald to unmute yourself and turn on your video to answer any questions. Janet is our finance administrator. As before, if you have questions or comments, please raise your hand and there will be a 90 second limit for each speaker. And then an opportunity for a final 67 comment by Janet. So are there any questions or comments? David, uh, George Isaac and Louise Mahood have their hands up in that order. Thank you. George, would you please unmute yourself and turn on your video? Okay, sorry for being such a pest. The one page document is not sufficient in my mind, especially the reporting of the current expenses. It does not meet the criteria that congregations must follow for the United Church. There's no list of assets or investments or current operating balance. No list of who is getting grants. The treasurer as stated in the town hall does not have such a list. This was alarming it by itself. And I'm particularly worried that the MNS monies are being used to fund region operating expenses. The grant should provide a good news story, but apparently there is some concern about being transparent. There's no summary of travel expenses. There's no list of who's being paid. There's no mention of an audit or an external review. In summary, the document does not meet any reasonable expected standard for accountability and should not be approved. I would like to uh, point out that uh, following the uh, town hall meeting, uh, a list of all uh, grant recipients is posted on our website and uh, I believe a link is uh, in the chat at the moment. Louise, uh, would you please unmute yourself and turn on your video? Good, am I in? No. Uh, we still need your video. I know. There we are. Okay, good morning. Um, I noticed that our income generation will be from the sale of property. Is it the intention to self-finance 
the regional council based on the lovingly made donations that built all these buildings um, and were given to the mission of the church. Is that the intention or is there going to be an opportunity to examine how we're funding ourselves as good use of our resources and mission? In other words, my point being that, is it appropriate for the regional council to assume that your positions and your staffing is to be um, funded solely on the sale of property given in love and support of the mission of the church, not the institutional staffing issues? Thank you. Uh, if I could uh, leap in ahead of Janet, uh, I'd like to point out that if you look at the five-year budget projections beyond the 2022 budget, you'll see that there is an increasing amount of revenue coming from property development. Up until this time, uh, not just in our region, but across all of Canada, the default response to church closures has been to sell the property, which as you have just pointed out, results in a, a one-time cash infusion, but uh, a loss of the long-term opportunity to fulfill mission possibilities. Shining Waters region uh, throughout this past year has uh, been working together with the United Property Resource Corporation, recently set up by the United Church of Canada, to examine all of our available properties to determine which of them can be developed to generate ongoing revenue streams. And there are currently four properties with which we are working to produce that outcome. That will not result in new revenue in 2022 because development projects take time to bring to fruition. But as I said, over the course of a five-year projection, you see an increasing amount of revenue coming in a stable and sustainable way from that source. And as other churches may close in the future, we will make the same kind of evaluation and hopefully I'll proceed further down this path to produce sustainable ongoing revenue and ongoing missional activity. John Ryerson has his hand up, David. Yes, John, would you please unmute yourself and turn on your video? Good morning. Um, I guess I was concerned about the diminishing staffing situation and in a later proposal, for reviewing where we're going. And there's a big difference between a diminishing survival kind of budget and a budget that grasps a new future. And I just find um, I'm inclined to agree that this is not an acceptable document at this stage, that we need to be looking at uh, a narrative from the budget that tells us where we're going, uh, not just uh, dwindling down on resources. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Angus Plenon has his hand up. Thank you. Angus, would you please unmute yourself and turn on your video? <laughs> Good morning, <clears throat> Angus McLennan, uh, Sutton, lay member. I've uh, had the uh, information in the past about developments through edge, um, is that what the uh, the property consultation is that we're involved in now? Uh, uh, I'm not sure I entirely f followed your question. Could you uh, uh, restate it one more time? So there is a uh, United Church of Canada group known as EDGE that had been working with property development. Is that the same as what uh, the region is involved with now? Um, 
I think uh, it is fair to say that uh, UPRC, the United Property Resource Corporation, is a successor or descendant of EDGE. It is not the same. Uh, where EDGE was essentially a planning body uh, that involved uh, trying to find developers who would help to uh, actually implement the plan. Uh, UPRC is a developer as well as a planner and uh, gives us an in-house expertise that uh, EDGE was not able to bring. Thank you. And so UPRC is, is not simply strictly shining waters. It's wider available to the United Church. That's right. It is a national organization active, uh, at least potentially, across the country. Uh, because we, Shining Waters Region, have uh, been quick to deal with it, we are uh, among its, uh, its first actual uh, ongoing projects. But it deals not only with regions, but also with individual communities of faith. And it is active uh, in the Maritimes, in Ontario, and across the country. And EDGE is no longer an entity? I'm not sure whether EDGE continues. Uh, it, yeah, EDGE, EDGE continues, but they don't do the property development piece anymore. They've, they've uh, moved back to their original purpose, which is ministry vision, future thinking, um, ministry development, experimenting, um, and the list goes on. And the property corporation has become a separate entity, an incorporated <clears throat> ministry that supports not only the United Church, but also um, contracts with other denominations that want to use their services. It, the, All right. you, Thank you very much. You're welcome. So David, uh, Brian McIntosh and Barbara Edwards have their hands raised. Okay, Brian, would you uh, unmute yourself? Yes, go ahead. Yes, thanks. I'm well, actually one of the, our, my con congregation I serve, Bloordale United in Tobacco, is one of uh, a number of congregations in Shining Waters that UPRC is serving. I'm really only on here to uh, ask about the potential sharing of the video that was shared on Wednesday evening that explains UPRC uh, in a somewhat clear manner. Um, to everyone. And uh, that was the first that I'd heard, seen of that video. And I, I would love to have that to share with my congregation and or others. So I guess I'm asking about the availability of that 11 minute, 45 second video. Right, if uh, there is time remaining before we break for lunch, uh, after discussion of the budget, we plan to show that video. If the discussion is so active that we do not have 11 minutes available, uh, we will not. But uh, I take your point that you would like access to it, even if it's not within this uh, regional council meeting. And I will ask staff to pursue that. Thank you, Brian. Barbara, would you please unmute yourself and turn on your video? I just want to say I have a very uncomfortable feeling about such a large percentage of the budget coming from sale. Um, I have, I'm in the unfortunate situation that in the span of six years, I was involved with communities of faith that ended up closing down, partly because development couldn't happen fast enough. Um, a situation happened that you used up a lot of reserves and then another thing like the boiler going and the chimney being replacing and that just pushed people over the edge. To have this high a percentage of the budget coming from sale, which is capital, not, yeah. your, not your income, I find very uncomfortable. And the proposed income from development down the road jumps at a fairly rapid rate. Yeah. 
All right, thank you. Your time has uh, expired. Are there other and, questions or comments? Uh, Bill Newman has his hand up. Yes. Bill, would you please unmute yourself and turn on your video? Just a question of, of uh, amplification on that uh, property sale line, not to beleaguer the point, but um, the numbers shown on the sale line, are they total proceeds from anticipated property sales? Or does that represent a portion of the total proceeds with some whatever number being reinvested to create uh, investment income? That sounds like a question for you, Janet. So I was going to say, I think it is. Um, basically, it is not the net. It is, it is the amount we need to take from reserves to balance the budget. Now, I don't know if that helps or not, but some of the money that from sales will be going to Indigenous ministries. Some of the money will be going to other things that the region has determined to be priorities. Um, and I can tell you, if the sales that are currently in progress happen, we will have more than enough money to cover this for the next five years. Okay, so well, well thank you. Um, so I'm, am I correct in inferring then that um, all of that money, it's, it's devoted to operating and there is not any income from sales that is being put in into an investment account to uh, separately generate investment income on the um, upper line. There will be some put into the investment accounts because we will not be using it all immediately. Um, that investment income line is very um, probably understated at this point, but it's a very conservative number. Um, as sales go, as sales happen, money goes into the investment account, which generates interest. We use the, some of that money then to pay for our operating expenses. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, just to echo an earlier comment, I think if the budget had, had been accompanied by a set of uh, assumptions or explanations, it, um, it might have helped somewhat. But, but thank you nonetheless for the clarification. Thank you. David, David uh, Louise Mahood has asked to speak again and also uh, Jingle Ayupan. All right, Louise, please unmute yourself and turn on your video. Um, I believe I'm on, is that correct? Uh, your sound is on, but not your video. Okay. There we are. Thank you. Um, I guess I would state again, my uh, concern as a director on, of the PTCC, if you're looking at investing in uh, certain kinds of mission, why is the money not being then put into something like the PTCC coffers for us to invest, and then we can create sustainable mission funding for specifically identified uh, work, i.e. with Indigenous uh, mission or uh, the like. So I'm, I'm concerned that you're, you know, the regional council is creating sort of this one little pocket over there to identify particular funding, and then uh, some financing from it when most of the financing for mission is emerging through the corporation of PTCC. So are you now trying to create another offshoot of funding? Thank you. Uh, in responding to a specific question, uh, a larger picture may not have been fully portrayed. Shining Waters Regional Council has a standing policy on the disposition of proceeds from property sales that uh, identify in order uh, a series of expenditure. Uh, and while I'm speaking from memory, I believe the, uh, the first priority is to replenish our Indigenous Ministries uh, and Right Relations Fund the second is to build up our regional fund to an established maximum. The third is uh, to re-establish funding for PTCC, the fourth, and so on. 
depending on the amount of property sales and whether the maximums have been reached in various funds, we move on to the, the next in the order of priority. So this is not uh, in any sense a departure from uh, that established policy. Are there are other questions. I believe. And just to, and just a comment related to PTCC is our hope is uh, uh, assuming funding allows us to transfer funds to P to PTCC. Yes, Jingle, would you please unmute yourself and turn on your video? Good morning, Mr. President, David, uh, Peter, and Janet. I'm coming for. I would just like to shift the discussion. I'm coming from an ethnic ministry of the Philippine Christian Fellowship, and I would just like to express our gratitude to the Shining Waters Junior Council for the six years of support financially. And I would just like to say that um, the church is thriving and we are blessed to have a very dynamic, vibrant leader. Um, and I'm grateful to, to your support. Thank you. Thank you. Anne Hawkins has her hand up, David. Yes, Anne, would you please unmute yourself? And yes, we see you. Good morning. And um, I have a couple of questions. This is only my second time on. So I, I went on the website to try and find audited statements for Shining Waters Regional Council. I couldn't find any. So um, if somebody can let me know where I can actually find um, an audited statement. Um, my, my second comment, um, I'm used to budgets that have a tremendous amount of detail in them in my previous uh, position. So a budget lines that were multiple. So every single one of your committees, there would be a breakdown, the committee would be named, an amount would be put in there. Um, so what I got for the five years, um, and I believe that George Isaacs mentioned this right at the start, just concerned about the lack of detail here to be able to know exactly where money is being expended. And I'm, you know, totally agree with the other people about the income piece. So if I can get information on that, I would appreciate it. Janet, uh, could you uh, answer the question about audited statements? I can answer the question about audited statements. They are at the auditors. And I hope they are done soon. <laughs> It, COVID has, has created some issues with a new organization and getting an audit done because we can't do it face to face. And every time there's a question raised, it takes two or three days. So it's taking a lot longer than planned. They will be posted on the website once they're done. I think another comment is that the executive um, does uh, review the budget in, in great detail and then recommends the budget to the regional council. This budget re reflects the many months of work that the executive has done on the, exec uh, on the budget. Um, they're very good about asking lots of detailed questions. They also provide oversight around the, uh, the audit. I think one of the unusual realities of COVID is that the auditors um, delayed doing the audit, which was really unprecedented. Uh, <laughs> Um, situation. One other comment I wanted to make, uh, just in reference to a comment that was made earlier, which was that the salaries are solely supported by the sale of property. That's actually inaccurate. Um, we do get a salary grant from general counsel, which um, supports um, my part-time work at Shining Waters Regional Council, Rachel's, and other staff this budget is a transition budget. Um, we, as a regional council, when, when we became a region, um, uh, elected to support a, a new um, approach to, to funding in the United Church of Canada. That approach meant that um, uh, we shifted um, uh, funding from former Toronto Conference to the United Church of Canada in an act of, of sharing. Part of, the, um, uh, part of the principles of that shift would be that the Regional Council could access um, uh, 
uh, money from the sale of properties to to at least transition to to a new budget. Uh, uh, I think one of the approaches that I've been advising the executive is to create a budget that would uh, both balance a shift in funding uh, um, of our ministry. We've seen a shift in staffing, which has been significant. Um, um, and at transition, uh, we shifted to a much smaller staff. And then the other piece is, is when we're in, when we're uh, supporting our budget, uh, a, a large number of our budget goes to the investment of, of mission and ministry. That's considered reinvestment in, in the ministry of our region and the work we do. If we were to have a budget that was entirely uh, based on our, uh, our, our grant from the general council, it would likely mean that we had about three staff and we would have very limited mission uh, giving. 100% of our MS budget goes to um, support of mission and ministry, not staffing. So David, we, we have three more questions and the uh, pe uh, people have raised their hands. Jeanette Sheik, Neela Young, Lang Moffat. Thank you. Jeanette, would you uh, go ahead and proceed? We see you now. I have two fairly brief questions. I hope what is most recent audited statement that is posted and is PTCC, uh, Press the Trees of the Toronto Conference Corporation, I think is what it stands for, only um, a Shining Waters entity or is it broader than that? Thank you. Um. Uh, I think Janet has already said the audited statements will be posted on the website as soon as they are available. Uh, PTCC uh, does hold funds uh, primarily for Shining Waters Regional Council, but also for two other regions that are uh, the successors to uh, uh, former presbyteries uh, in Toronto Conference. Uh, but the vast majority of the holdings uh, of PTCC are uh, Shining Waters funds. Neil Young, please unmute yourself and turn on your video. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am one of the original pushers back uh, questioners about the use of uh, capital proceeds of property sale for the support of the region budget so i want to speak uh, in favor of the five-year projection and budget that's in front of us i think it's a good first response solid piece of work uh, as i read it even without a narrative the attempt is to project a future in which we are not using proceeds of sale at least not to such a great extent and i believe a five-year projection that's laid out right now shows a very realistic idea that notwithstanding so much to do and so many good things we won't be able to sustain a staff budget or a, a grant budget that continually goes up and up and i see consolidation going on there i think this is a useful document a good first step obviously with lots more work thank you thank you neil Lang Moffat, would you please unmute yourself and turn on your video? Um, I just would like to echo the comments that the report for the amount of dollars involved seems to be minimal, absolutely minimal. And I would ask the Finance Committee to review in the coming year a more wholesome financial statement for us to deal with and inform us. The second thing I would like to comment on, we get the auditor's formal report, but the most valuable part often of the audit is the letter which goes on after that to the management, telling them of things that they think might be done better, et cetera. Um, I don't, we never seem to hear anything about that letter. I don't know who gets it, and who gets it to act on. But I would just point it out as being a, a valuable part of the audit and uh, it would be helpful 
uh, to know that either at least the finance committee or somebody was reviewing that for improvements. As my understanding is that that management letter would go to the executive. Are there any other questions or comments? Not seeing any further uh, hands raised, David. All right, Janet, would you then uh, make a closing statement? My closing statement would be that um, I agree that we need to keep working on the development of our properties. Um, and you can see that will be happening. Um, the grant information that was asked for is on the website. So please look at it. Um, I thank you to Donna for the video. If you haven't seen it, please watch it. Um, and I think that's all I want to say at this point. All right, then. Could we have the motion uh, put up on the screen, please? So it is moved by Dong Chun Seo and seconded by Stephen Loweth that Shining Waters Regional Council approved the 2022 draft budget as presented. You've heard the motion before you. If you wish to vote yes, please raise your hand now. And again, participants on the phone, please use star nine. And if there are multiple users sharing a computer, please type your vote in the chat to Kim Udikai. All right, the uh, yes votes have been counted. Thank you. If you wish to vote no, please raise your hand now. The no votes have been counted. And if you wish to abstain, please raise your hand now. <clears throat> the abstentions have been counted. The result of the vote is 99 yes, 8 no, and 6 abstentions. Thank you very much. The motion is carried. And at this time, I invite Eric Matheson to turn on your video and unmute yourself. Eric is the Chief Financial Officer for the United Church and also a director of the United Property Resource Corporation. Welcome, Eric, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I, th I guess this is how we bring greetings from uh, the different courts these days. Uh, so I, I suppose I bring greetings from, from general counsel. And uh, I've prepared a, a, a short uh, deck that I will endeavor to share right now. And uh, uh, these are the areas that uh, that I've been asked to speak to a little bit, but uh, you know I'm happy to field any questions that uh, that people might have. So I'm assuming you can uh, see my screen, and I'm going to yes, we can just make it a bit bigger, and uh, we'll uh, we'll kick things off. So. Uh, I'll be speaking from a national perspective, but it doesn't matter where we're speaking from. Uh, first of all, every financial metric deserves an asterisk uh, for last year and this year. And, and uh, you know, I it's unprecedented, unprecedented uncertainty in terms of uh, uh, projecting what uh, new normal might look like. And I'm sure you've discussed that. So uh, the, the first point that uh, we remind people always, whether it's national or uh, regional or anywhere else, is that uh, all the, uh, you know, the, the major share of the funding, aside from some of the, you know, the property conversation you've had, uh, comes from the pews, uh, either in the form of mission and service uh, or assessments. And I'll be talking a little bit about, uh, about assessments today. The, uh, the, the one thing with assessments is that it really advances the, the general counsel uh, mandate we had around sharing. It's a, it's a pretty significant change. And uh, frankly, Shining Waters uh, was a, a leader in starting that thinking uh, around sharing beyond your borders and so on when, in the old Toronto conference. And uh, it's, it's important to note that the assessment that we have uh, ensures that every congregation in some, at least in some small way, is participating in the funding of the Indigenous Church. Uh, there's 5.9 million that is split equally across 
the, the, the 16 regions. Uh, and then there's the, the general council portion, which funds the governance, governance there. So this is just a quick snapshot of um, what we've got. And I'll be diving into the numbers a bit more later on. Uh, the first thing uh, people have been asking about just from a timeliness point of view is the, you know, anything new on the federal government front. And uh, the main news is that for us, it, that the party's kind of over. Uh, there is a possibility that some congregations uh, that are looking uh, you know, at staffing up, uh, perhaps coming out of, out of COVID, they might be eligible for something called the Canada Recovery Hiring Program. But basically the wage subsidy that uh, has been so important to many congregations, uh, that, that party is over, uh, assuming of course that uh, parliament approves, approves everything with the minority government. The uh, a couple, you know, there's some details in here that most of you needn't care about. Your treasurers should be looking after it. But uh, uh, just a couple of stats across the country, uh, reported revenue for 2020 would have been down almost 20% uh, were it not for wage subsidies. There were wage subsidies reported by congregations of about $25 million across the country. And, and frankly, I know from helping a, a number of the folks and congregations uh, participating here, a lot of that was in Ontario. Uh, there was also seven or $8 million of uh, federal loans, those interest-free loans that carry on uh, into next year, actually, on an interest-free basis. They were called SEBA loans. So uh, frankly, that, that's been a huge help, uh, as, as much of a struggle as, it, as it's been financially. Uh, donations actually held up more than obviously, you know, this is perhaps obvious to everybody, but the donations held up better than, than <laughs> things like rentals when you have a closed building. So uh, that's the news on the federal side. Uh, this is something I stress, but you, you might not hear about it as much uh, because I talk to the financial people, but uh, we've been leapfrogged into the future in terms of, uh, of online dealings of all kinds, uh, whether that's receiving monies at a local congregation. But from a CRA perspective, it's just the norm now uh, to have a, a My Business account the same way you might have personally. And um, again, if you're a treasurer, you might have a payroll discrepancy notice or something, but, but uh, those are uh, messages for treasurers. So uh, I said year of the asterisk. So congregational reported revenue overall down 12.7% uh, and almost 20% without the wage subsidies. Um, we, you know, one gratifying thing this year, we had a, a very significant dip in congregational M&S giving, uh, you know, for the 2020 year. And so far this year, it's actually bounced back up a little bit and that's really encouraging. Uh, but uh, as I said right from the outset, uh, COVID uncertainty is still a big deal. So uh, assessment is one of the things that I was asked to ask to speak to. And uh, let me just say that uh, the assessment notices are online now for every single uh, you know, pastoral charge in the country. Um, your region, we'll have this coming week, next week, or I guess Monday or Tuesday, frankly, uh, an updated uh, master spreadsheet, which uh, will describe the situation for every uh, pastoral charge in your region. So in Shining Waters, uh, you're one of the four uh, regions that, that was, for historical reasons, was looking at some pretty significant assessment increases when we launched this thing a few years ago. And one thing that COVID has done has, is dramatically reduced the gap that uh, we would have had. Uh, you know, I know from my own congregation, uh, we voted in favor of the remit, but our, we, we, the numbers we were looking at at the time were an increase of uh, two and a half times our assessment. And uh, you know, with the economic and COVID situation, uh, that number is a bit more manageable for us. 
in any case, uh, for Shining Waters, the quarry, next year's assessment, uh, just under half of, of uh, pastoral charges uh, are, are seeing, uh, or I'm, let's see, 73 out of one. Actually, uh, I think I have that wording right. 73 are seeing increases. So more than half are, uh, are going to be either flat or decreasing based on their reported revenues for 2020. The executive, the general counsel executive this spring put in a further COVID related provision for congregations looking at uh, larger increases to spread that increase over uh, 2022 and into 2023. Uh, you might recall the original uh, plan was a three year freeze. And for uh, anyone uh, wanting to look at your specific situation, this is all explained in, in uh, pretty good detail, frankly, uh, on, the, uh, on the statement. So again, speaking nationally, 11 regions decrease in assessment for 2022. Uh, one region that was looking at about 20% increases ends up being flat. Again, that's because if I may, the, the, with the drop in revenue COVID related, and this being a revenue based assessment, it's doing uh, exactly what we really want it to do. So, but even when there are averages that say decrease, there will still be some within the region, depending on their revenues and, and their history and the history of their presbytery before that, uh, that we'll be looking at, at uh, increases. Uh, if they were part of the uh, three-year freeze option. So again, when I was talking to my treasurers, uh, I was using one-year-old data back in the spring, and I was saying, we can't know, but uh, uh, when we update the numbers, we anticipate that assessment will, uh, will decrease markedly, and it has. Uh, again, nationally by, by about $2 million. So if you're, if, and you, uh, you know, each governor I think should know whether they were, you know, assessment is a fairly meaningful uh, cost. You should know whether you were at target or um, chose the freeze option. But uh, in my view, every single, uh, there had to be a, a very unique circumstance for a uh, community of faith or pastoral charge that to, uh, even have a flat assessment for, for the coming year because virtually everyone saw revenue uh, decreases. So if you were at target, you're almost certainly paying less. If you weren't at target, if you were part of the three-year transition, you're now looking at much smaller increases than before. And in many cases, those increases disappeared, period. Uh, again, with the reflecting what's going on at the local level. And, uh, you know, if I may say, that is the whole idea of, uh, or one of the key principles of the new funding model is, is that it adjusts for uh, what's happening, uh, you know, on the, on the revenue picture. So this is a very busy slide and I, I don't offer it so you can digest, uh, you know, the numbers particularly. Uh, but the, it does show the right handmost column with the percentages shows the 11 regions with decreases uh, and, and, the, and the highlighted yellow one there is Antler River, which has, is uh, perfectly flat. And, uh, and, and frankly, the, uh, the where, where regions are looking at increases as Shining Waters is, uh, the, uh, the, the other regions tend to be in Ontario as well, because that's, the, you know, we knew that four and five years ago uh, in moving to a uh, consistent, uh, uh, you know, threshold across the country. So, so what this says for Shining Waters, which is uh, in, uh, number 10 there, is that there's over 200,000, 233,819 in increases being spread across those 73 pastoral charges that I talked about. 
Uh, and you'll note though that the, 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 you know, the next column over is, is what the total of assessment, it's 1.49 uh, million for, for uh, Shining Waters. You'll see that you know, that isn't, uh, that's about half. So basically uh, there's a lot of decreases in there as well. And uh, the main point I'd like to make with this, with this slide is a couple of things. One, it reflects the size of Shining Waters and the other uh, larger uh, regions uh, in terms of um, often number of, of pastoral charges, but also uh, financial capacity. So it, it, it starts to reflect the uh, sharing model and it's part of the whole move we have towards transparency. Because uh, eight years ago, Toronto Conference would have been the only conference in the country that knew what its presbyteries were assessing, because everybody else didn't care. They just it, they just build presbyteries, and National didn't even collect the stat. So this is uh, you know you know I love this stuff. I can understand that most of you probably have your had your eyes glaze over already. So uh, it, it again mechanics, but just to know we're you know we we're trying to apply three years of learning to you know just administrative rules. So uh, you, particularly in situations where there are closures or uh, amalgamations. So uh, you know we we did have the general counsel recall approve the concept of a full assessment being collected in in a final year of operation. And the idea there would be it would come, you know, it would likely be funded from, uh, you know, any residual closing proceeds, for example. Uh, we've, we've also suggested that, uh, you know, if there's a hardship, either at a closure or even on, on a regular basis, that, uh, that the, the possibility of having loans to help that along, as we've done through COVID, uh, is, a, is another option for people. So this is stuff that's, uh, again, uh, of interest to folks who, who might uh, need to know what the situation is if they're closing, but I'll keep moving forward here. A key change uh, in the formula was the how we measure uh, and track investment revenue, and in particular, market gains. Uh, the, the intent, uh, this again was, this formula was approved by uh, the, the recall of general counsel, uh, I guess about a month ago. Or, and uh, what this does is instead of uh, trying to move up and down with the way investment returns can do, we, by, by assessing the investment balance, you effect, in effect smooth things out. So I'll, I'll show you a page on that in just a second. But the, uh, this was actually suggested to us by uh, congregations across the country with small amounts and large amounts. And, and the idea is that, uh, you know, just for example, in 2018, most of us with investments would have had a zero or negative return. The year after that, many of us would have had over 10% returns. If you're assessing you know, that would cause a swing nationally of, of millions of dollars. And it also becomes uh, impossible for local treasurers to uh, predict or manage uh, the assessment. So the whole idea here is to make it steady state kind of predictable. Uh, we assess a little more in, in, in poor investment years than you might have made. But in, in in many, many investment years, we, we won't assess the full investment market gain. So that's the concept. And it has the effect of smoothing things out. Uh, and for 2022 assessments, it actually didn't change much of anything. So that, uh, the approach made it easier to understand and communicate, uh, but it, it, you know, it is not a money grab. Uh, if anything, it's leaving some money on the table and uh, one of the other rules we put in is the $100,000 uh, floor where we exempt the first $100,000 to provide for the fact that lots of places just have uh, relatively small balances. And here comes another busy one. Uh, and this, uh, again, 
the the key columns are the, the number that says assets. And so what this chart says at the very top is that 20 congregations across the country have over four million dollars in uh, in assets. They might be restricted funds, they might be endowments, but but in reported long-term investments. And at the bottom, we've got uh, I think you know a uh, thousand that have uh, less than a hundred thousand, or nine hundred and twenty-nine actually. But you know uh, you get the the feeling. So this this is a way that nationally we're tracking what the uh, impact would have been of, of applying this formula. And this, you know, as, as busy as this chart looks, uh, it gave our decision makers a lot of comfort around uh, the fact that it was going to produce the smoothing result that we were looking for. And it also targets, uh, or targets, uh, it, it looks to a larger contribution from those with, with greater wealth. Uh, but I want to say that this, this has been supported, uh, this concept has been supported by uh, the, you know, folks with the largest holdings, uh, including several in, uh, in your region. So, uh, you know, those, that's the slides I have, and I'll unshare my screen in just a second. But, but uh, you know, the reason we do all this assessment stuff and the administrative stuff and the CRA stuff is because it's a it's a necessary thing in order to be able to devote for so many of you to devote your energies more fully on the mission side and so we always want to remind folks to and thank them for supporting the mission sorry about that i'm not sure whether that was my end or yours but uh um i hope that was helpful i can bring those screens back up if if you like uh but the uh, but the main message is that uh we're very close to completing the transition uh in, in terms of the new funding model uh that'll be it'll be fully in place for january 2023 and uh, uh so far it's doing what we want it to do uh, that being said, uh, whether it's MS or whether it's assessment or whether it's local giving, uh, you know, we know we're bucking a lot of trends. And so uh, the, the way you folks have set up your budget and, and are, you know, planning uh, to uh, derive revenue streams on an ongoing basis from property as opposed to one time basis, uh, I applaud you for that. All right, thank you, Eric. Are there any questions uh, or comments for Eric? Again, if you have any, please raise your hand. Deborah Hart has her hand up. Yes, Deborah, please unmute yourself and turn on your video. There you are. Uh, hi, Eric, you had said you would answer about uh, the mission and service national grants and uh, what comes down to the region. Um, and uh, you sent me a, a, a good explanation, but I would love it if you would share that with the rest of the court. Uh, sure. Uh, and and uh, uh, I think Deborah's question to me started with uh, the prediction of a drop in M and S, uh, you know, on your multi-year budget uh, sheets. And and one of my comments was. Uh, uh, simply that, uh, you know, I think that's intended to be a signal uh, that, that uh, you know, certain of these revenue streams uh, are challenged. Uh, mission and service has been going down now for uh, almost, uh, well, certainly for 15 years. It's, uh, I think, 2000, since 2007. And so one of the questions was around, or, or Deborah's question was around the proportion of M&S coming back to the region. And uh, in the case of Shining Waters, uh, part of the answer here is, is the sharing thing again, because uh, MNS 3.8 million, 3.84, I think, million uh, is distributed equally across the 16 regions. So that's 3.8 million. Uh, the, the, you know, other big chunks are the indigenous 
uh, work across the country, which is largely funded nationally. I know you folks do some and some other regions do too, but that's 4.6 million. And the, and the global work uh, is, is uh, about 4 million now. So we are managing or have been managing a somewhat shrinking pie. And, and Frank, you know, the hope is that having a mission and vision statement now to rally around, uh, that we might be able to reverse that trend to some degree. But, uh, but overall, uh, more m and has been made available uh, in the new funding model. Uh, to give you an idea, the old uh, conference block grant uh, was 3.2 million before uh, the restructuring. And even with some cuts, it's 3.8 million now. Um, so uh, I'm not trying to be overly cheerful here. I'm, you know, the finance people have to take a, you know, we uh, we sort of, we like to say that we uh, hope for the best, but plan for something less than that. And I think you said that the indigenous work was about 90% of it was funded nationally and same with yes. the global, but also uh, yes, the, I mean you folks also think, theological colleges. You said as well. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. So I, if you know, I can send along uh, you know detailed. If folks are, are used to seeing the pie charts that talk about all the different granting and so on, um, that continues, and we're hoping to refine them and make them more detailed. I, I heard a request for detail, uh, but yes, we you know the theological schools are 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 still a million plus, and there's you know faith formation work, various things, but. Uh, but I, I would point people to the, uh, the, the famous m and pie charts because they do split out actual grant dollars plus programming cost. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? And Neil Young has his hand up, David. Yes, Neil, would you please unmute yourself and turn on your video? You Thank are. you. Hello, Eric. Uh, Neil here. We've been going back and forth this year. You've been very generous with your, your time and interest. Thank you very much. Uh, emailing. Uh, my, my question is one that uh, is in some figures that, uh, that, that you have provided. Could you just say a piece about, you've talked about how the evaporation of uh, federal government money flowing into local congregations might have an impact. What about in the national budget? What was being received, or if anything, from, from grants, from uh, uh, various pro federal programs? And what do you see as the impact on the income stream uh, now that those programs are done? Yeah, uh, great question. Actually, nationally, uh, we, uh, we qualify for significant uh, uh, wage subsidies uh, because of, in some cases, the timing. Uh, we, so we qualified for a total, I think, of 5.8 million uh, in 2020. Uh, and uh, it, it's important to realize that, uh, for example, a significant portion, Kairos operates under our charitable number. Right. And, and Kairos, uh, uh, frankly, got crushed by uh, COVID because uh, a significant part for them was their blanket exercise. So uh, for us, it uh, or nationally, it's a big number, uh, but we're also positioned to, uh, you know, it's it's it's.